Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. We have Maki here with us at Shapeways talking about full color 3D printing. I am Rhonda Geek, Director of Marketing Communications at Shapeways. And before we get started and I introduce our speakers, I would like to do a little housekeeping items. On your right side of your screen, you will see a chat. You can ask all of your questions there. We will try to get to all of them. If we don't, we will follow up in an email with you. There's also going to be poll questions and some handouts. And with that, I would like to introduce our two speakers, Steve Wart and Josh Hope. I'm going to turn it over to them so that they can tell you a little more about themselves. And with that, Steve, I'll let you take over. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, yeah, so Steve Ward, Director of Customer Success here. So essentially, I'm in charge of anything that's related to the customer after purchase. So uh, if you need any help from anything from like material consultations, like learning more about Momaki and how to print with them, all the way to just like tracking your order, you'd be working with me or a member of my team. Um, been in the atom manufacturing industry for about seven and a half years. So I have to say every single day, always interested in seeing kind of what new amazing technology um, that's come out. Um, and specifically, one of them that I'm most interested in learning more about today is Bamaki. So with that, I'll pass you off to Josh. Thanks, Steve. So my name is Josh Hope. I'm Senior Manager for Digital Imaging and Innovation at Momaki, which, which basically means I get to play with the cool stuff before anybody else does, which is, which is a great position. Uh, so I've been in the printing industry for 25 plus years, um, but since 2017, I've really been focused on uh, the full color 3D products from Momaki. Um, so I am uh, kind of uh, evangelize about the, about the product, let people know what you can do with it, help them see the, the possibilities for it. And then we have a great team here at Mamaki, um, Jaime Martinez, uh, who does a lot of our file prep and things like that. A lot of the models that you're gonna see today, um, he did a lot of the, the prep and preparation for it. And we're really excited to be able to uh, work with Shapeways because we know that they also have some super talented people and uh, going to be able to output some some amazing results with these machines. So from there, I think we're just going to jump in. So my, I'm I'm oh I'm controlling the slides. Sorry, folks. So <laughs> this is uh, something I was trying to unmute and it was not working. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so before we start, yes, you are controlling the slides, Josh. But we do have a poll question. Well, um, so if you go to your poll tabs, you should see the question on your screen. If you can take a few moments to fill this out so that we can see what level everyone is. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> I, like, I like the poll thing. This is exciting. So, so far, it looks it. like it's a really good mix uh, of, of people. Yeah. I like to see more, you know, obviously advanced because, you know, it's hard to design for full color, right? It's not as easy as just designing for a regular 3D file. So it's it's, uh, it's nice to have a couple of advanced users in here too, um, kind of learning about this technology. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's the really great thing is that, you know, I, I look back at some of the previous printing technologies like in, in uh, cheap bed offset printing when we started going to digital to play and, and desktop publishing even, um, customers really heavily relied on service bureaus to be able to get that output because they, they were still learning about the technology. The machines were a lot of, uh, you know, out of their reach from a, from a budgetary standpoint. And so I see this as being a really similar, uh, um, situation. And that's why we're so excited for, um, Shapeways to be able to really pave the path and take a lot of that learning edge off and say, Hey, let us just, you design it and let us show you what the output can be. And then those those two ends will kind of grow together, right? Awesome. So yeah, it looks like we've got most of the people answered, and, and again, it looks like a, a pretty good pretty good mix uh, uh, with beginner and advanced being the, the two highest ones. So that's that's interesting. All right. So uh, I think we're going to go ahead and jump in here. So just uh, to talk a minute about Momaki Engineering. So I work for Momaki USA. We're a subsidiary of Momaki Engineering. But Momaki is not necessarily a, a household name if, uh, if you don't come from the uh, wide format inkjet or textile inkjet world. 
Um, but Momonk has been around since 1975. We've got over 1,900 employees worldwide. They're on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Um, and you can see we've got locations all around the world. And in the United States, we actually have six uh, regional offices throughout the United States. So uh, Momaki is, like I said, not exactly a household name. It's definitely uh, a name that's, that's been a strong name in the, in the printing industry for a long time. So while Momaki started off as 2D printers, cutters, flatbed printers, things like that, um, back in the end of 2017, we announced the Momaki 3D UJ553. Um, and we sold our very first unit in December of 2017. So this is the, the flagship model from Momaki. This is the, the machine that if you're sending uh, full color models to Shapeways to be printed, this is the device that, that they're gonna be printed on. So we wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about um, some of the technology behind it. You're gonna see some examples of um, uh, prints that have been done and, and talk about you know, what markets are, are uh, using this machine. Now, Josh, was this the first 3D printer that Momaki developed? This is the very first one. And it's, it's, it's really kind of interesting because with other uh, printer companies, they, they came at color, full color 3D printing uh, with a 3D background and then tried to figure out color. Whereas Momaki had an extremely strong color background and then we worked to learn 3D. So it's, it's kind of two different directions. But uh, yeah, it's I think somewhat interesting to have your very first 3D printer be a, a flagship industrial uh, machine, but, but that's where we are, yeah. Fascinating. So a uh, quick shout out to this artist, uh, uh, Maria Panfalova, she, this is a, a piece that she did in ZBrush uh, that we printed out on the 3D UJ553, just a really incredible artist and, and a really cool piece. Uh, but the, the more dry part of this is the specification. So just to, to break this down, the, the machine is printing with uh, UV cured photopolymer resin. So it's liquid that's being turned to a solid. We jet those through eight industrial inkjet heads. So there's one each for cyan, magenta, yellow, black, white, and clear, and then two uh, heads for support. Um, and, it's, and it's good to note, uh, I probably should have had a, a uh, illustration of this, I apologize, but it's good to note that the, if you were to take this model and cut it in half, it would, it would uh, what you would see is you would see a mix of white and clear on the center, and then the outside edge would just have the color. Right, so think of like a, an M&M where you've got the hard candy shell and then the chocolate on the middle. This is a similar idea. Um, but the color that's on the outside is pigmented resin. So it's the same physical properties as what's building the structure. So we're not, uh, we're not jetting white and then coloring it. We're actually jetting pigmented resin. So, so the outside color layer is just as strong as the inside. Right. We have a very large build size, so up to 20 by 20 by 12 inches. Um, and just as a little point of reference, the reason that we call this the 553 machine is 508 by 508 by 305 millimeters. That's that's where that comes from. Right. So there's four print modes. Uh, there's a 22, 32 and 42 micron for the for the Z thickness, the layer thickness. And then we have one special uh, print mode that's called color and clear that goes down to 19 microns. Right. Uh, we cure the, uh, uh, the resin using uh, UV LED lamps, so it's a cooler uh, lamp, so you get less warping. We use a flattening roller, and then there's a dedicated PC with a, with a touch screen that we use. Okay. A couple quick questions on this one, Josh. When you say color and clear, can you actually print in, like, transparent colors, or what does that mean? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a really cool mode where... Um, you're, you're basically taking a full color model like you see here and then encasing the entire thing in clear, whether it was a sphere or a cube or even just the actual shape of the model with just a, you know, a, a thin layer of clear all the way around it, however the artist has designed it. But it's just a special print mode that prints a little bit thinner uh, in order to maintain the, uh, um, so we don't get a lot of bleeding between the color section and the clear section. It's used a lot. Um, we've got a couple artists. Uh, there's an artist, David Heron, which you'll see on uh, Instagram, who does a lot with like surfers and waves, does some really cool things with this, uh, with that print mode. And then we have a lot of medical uh, applications that are that are using this as well for medical models. 
really interesting. And then the other thing is, when you say flattening roller, how does that apply to the technology? If you're just curing, you know, colors layer by layer, where does the roller come in? Yeah, there's there's a graphic for that a, a little bit later, but basically the idea is that when we're jetting down this this resin, um, we're using one LED lamp to what they call pinning the the material. So you're basically using the one lamp to hold the liquid in place and get it to a semi uh, rigid format. And then the 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 roller is is literally that. It's a, it's a metal roller like a rolling pin that goes over that layer, and that's what maintains that that uh, layer thickness. And then as that returns, I, the, uh, the final LED lamp cures it to a solid, and then we start the process again. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, so this is the world's first truly photorealistic full color printer. Um, so we, we uh, were able to print over 10 million unique colors, which this is 10 to 20 times more than our closest competitors. Um, again, printing with CMYK white and clear um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a pig, pigmented uh, liquid photopolymer resin, jetting it out, super, super accurate dot placement, drop placement. Um, and that's how we're able to get uh, the colors that we can. Here, um, does it yellow? So uh, it, is a, it is a photopolymer. So there is, a, 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 there is currently a little bit of a yellow tint to it. Um, it doesn't tend to yellow much over time, um, but we have some exciting things coming up that we'll be able to talk about uh, probably closer to the rapid TCT time, which will be uh, mid-September. So stay tuned then and ask again about our clear. And I have a quick question on this slide. Josh, yeah. is that actually 3D printed, that image right there? <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is one of our more famous images. Um, this is a model uh, by a, uh, a, a photogrammetry studio out of the UK called 1024. Um, and that's an actual uh, photo of a man that's been turned to a 3D print, and that is printed directly on the Momaki 3D UJ553. It's, it's eerie how realistic it looks. Um, and, and the reason that I like to use this, this picture is that a lot of times when you see uh, sample 3D prints, they're always really, really bright, vibrant color you know, they're bright red and oranges and greens, which is which is great. But even if you have a very limited color palette, you can hit those colors. A lot of times where this 10 million colors comes in is things like this. It's subtle shading. It's it's the difference between going from the, the ruddy pink of his cheeks down to his uh, start of a five o'clock shadow on, on his upper lip, right? I mean, those are the subtle things that if you have a limited palette, you, you cannot uh, reproduce those, right? So, so it's a really, it's a, it's a great, great sample. And, and um, we use it a lot, but he is, um, uh, I think the adjective that we get most often when people hold that model in their hand is creepy. So, yeah, I mean, he doesn't look happy. Like I, I would say that, but um, yeah. again, the, the, the realistic like coloring and everything else is just mind blowing. It's, it's amazing to see what that machine could do. Yeah, he's he's clearly a man who has seen some things, and, and we're we're really uh, excited that we're able to reproduce that and and be able to show that to people. Josh, what size is the is the man printed in? Um, we've printed him in a whole bunch of different sizes. That particular one is a uh, it's a bust that is probably about uh, four inches tall, but we've printed that face as a as a full size head. Um, we've, we've done smaller ones, um, all different sizes, right? And, that, and that's one of the really great things about having that large build area is you have the ability to not only print something really huge, which we'll show in a little bit, uh, but also the ability to, to mass produce a bunch of things, you know, so you can step them out in X, Y direction, but you can also step them out in the Z direction and fill the entire bed and, and, and print a lot, right? All right. So... Uh, another shout out to an artist here, uh, Carlos Ortega, a uh, very, very talented artist. That piece is actually printed in four pieces. Uh, and we did this mostly just so we could easily pack it and ship it. So the base is separate, the body is all together, and then the two wings are separate as well. And, the, and uh, Jaime Martinez just did an amazing job of, of uh, notching out the back for the wings so that they just set in uh, uh, very cleanly so it, it ships really well. 
Um, this is again another ZBrush um, uh, sculpt. Um, so, but the, the point of this slide is, is really the fact that again, uh, Mamaki, we've got over 17 years of flatbed UV printer innovation. That's where uh, this machine comes from, is from the UV, the flatbed UV printer world. Um, so the same printers that, you know, people might use to print on USB drives or, or things like that, that same flatbed technology and UV curing is what's used in the, in the 3D device. So in 2004, we came out with the world's first UV curable flatbed printer with white ink. Uh, 2010, the world's first UV uh, LED curable benchtop inkjet printer. And then in 2017, the world's first full color 3D printer that can do over 10 million colors. So there's a, a nice lineage here for these machines. Interesting. So essentially, you use the 2D technology to then just add a Z axis into it and then kind of bring the color of Mamaki to 3D printing. Is, yeah, that, is that kind of what you're saying? Exactly. If, 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 you're, if anybody on here has, has, has used flatbed UV printers before, you know that you can get texture um, and some textile feel just by printing layer on top of layer on top of layer. And then what the Mamaki engineers looked at and said was, why do we need to stop at a couple millimeters? Why can't we just keep going? And then that ability to, to print just using the white and clear as that center and put the color on the outside edge, um, it, it just came together in, in, a, in a really fantastic way. Yeah. Josh, can you mix clear and color? Uh, you can, you can. So, so within our software, well, two things. One is that um, the models themselves, the overall build volume is a mix of, of white and clear together. And that's done for a couple different reasons. Um, white ink is a more expensive ink on in any uh, inkjet technology because of the, the pigments that are used in it. Um, so uh, we use the white to be able to, to help with the reflectance in order to give the, the color some background. Um, but we also use clear in order to help keep that, that cost down. Um, but if you have a model that's, uh, let's say you have an ST uh, or a series of STLs that are broken out. So a model that has different uh, parts to it that some are, are uh, or, or are separate STLs that, that come together within the software, you can assign one to be color, one to be clear, one to be white, one to be transparent, whatever it might be, um, and then have those print all at the same time. So, so it can print um, at the same time, color, clear, solid, all together. This uh, uh, piece in particular looks very delicate. How durable are these parts? Yeah, so so that's that's a great question and one that, that we get a lot. Um, there are some numbers around the strength of it and things like that, but the reality is is that. Uh, this machine was designed really to be more of a uh, prototyping type machine. However, um, we found that the parts are strong enough that we can use, um, um, do things like this that would be considered not really toys, but collectibles. So the idea that you could handle this, um, you, can, you can pick it up, you can look at it and then put it on the shelf is absolutely fine. You're, you're not going to want to give it to your five-year-old. Um, if you were to drop that from any height on a hard surface, it, it will probably uh, crack. Yeah. So it's it's got some properties similar to ABS, um, but um, yeah, it's it, it and a lot of it depends on um, the the object itself. For example, um, if I take a look at at this guy, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but um, I can put uh, a good bit of pressure on his legs, and they're not going to break. But if I tried to do the same thing on this sword, you can see it's, it's got some flexibility to it, right? So you have to be conscious of that in the design. But yeah, it's, it's, you're, you're not going to be printing, um, uh, you know, functional tools or, or toys with this. But um, we do have multiple customers who are doing uh, higher end collectibles. Uh, this is a, a great example of one here, right? And I think everybody knows about uh, these folks, right? Hero Forge. Uh, so they're a uh, big Shapeways uh, partner, and so they're printing uh, these little guys. There you go. Yeah, get them in there. And so, uh, you know, nice small things. And again, they've got um, they've got some durability to them. But you know, if you if you uh, really uh, put your hand down on it, you you will definitely crack. But that's the that's the great thing about the Shapeways uh, uh, offering, right? Is is if you want to figure out 
what is the tensile strength? How is this going to work for my application? Send your model to Shapeways, print a sample, and, and, and get it in your hands and, and see how it's going to feel and how it works for you. Um, that's, that's really the best way to do it. We have one more question. Yep. Are the um, models post-processed or do they come out of the printer looking just like this? Excellent question. So um, in, uh, in the earlier slide, we talked about the fact that there is a support material. So we use a water soluble support material, meaning that, um, uh, can you guys see my cursor on the screen? No? Okay. All right. So, All right. so if you look at this model that, that we're showing here, and let, let's say that we printed it exactly in that orientation, right? So you've got the four legs. We're jetting a liquid, right? And then we're turning that to a solid. So in order for us to get the, the belly of that beast or, or the, the knee there, right? There's a gap between the base and where that part of the mo model starts. The ink or the resin has to have something to, to land on so that we can cure it. So what we do is we print the uh, water soluble support material from, from the base up to where the model is going to start. And then we jet resin on top of that, cure it there. So it's it's one big um, uh, solid piece. And then we, once the, the model comes out, we break away the support material and then we'll, we'll soak it to dissolve the rest of it. Once that, that support material is all dissolved, what you see here is the final piece. So that piece, um, there's been no post coloring, there's been no painting, there's been no uh, color touch up, there's no coating on it, there's no sprays, there's no nothing else. So. Uh, when you say post-processing, there is post-processing to dissolve the support material, but but nothing else. Now, we do have some uh, customers who have applications that they do want some kind of a, a post-spray, whether they want it to be more glossy or more matte, um, or they need some kind of a protective uh, coating on it for special applications. But in this case, that color that you see, that's the color you can expect coming out of a model from Shapeways. Great. We have lots of great questions coming in, but we are going to go to a poll question because some of the questions the audience have asked um, are coming up in the presentation. Okay. So our question to everyone is how many um, of you have printed in 3D full, uh, pr 3D printed in full color? Give everyone a few moments to answer this. Wow. Yeah, way more I've printed than I thought it would have actually printed before. So that's that's exciting. Yeah, it's it's interesting because you know, as we go to, to trade shows and webinar or, or trade shows and things like that, and, we, and we're talking to customers, there seems to be an equal balance of people who have been uh, exposed to color 3D printing since it was originally started back in the, believe it or not, the 80s. Um, as people that have absolutely no idea that this can be done at all, right? So it's kind of not a surprise to, to see that mix. Um, but, but you know, again, this is one of the things that, that really excites Mamaki about working with Shapeways is um, to make this more accessible and get it out to more people so that we can see that this poll, um, you know, when we come back and do some, uh, uh, hopefully some, some webinars with uh, Jaime on the specifics of how to prepare files for, color printing that we see that the, uh, the yes, I've, I have uh, the printed piece, we see that that line go way, way up because people have been more exposed to, to Shapeways and to the Mamaki technology. Cool. Any other questions or should I move on? We do have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, one is this person saw an outdoor sign for their first example. What type of lifespan can you expect with that type of exposure? And then there's a follow-up question of how does it handle heat and deform uh, deformities from the heat? So this is this is an excellent question, and and I'm going to be a little bit uh, candid on this one. So Mamaki, coming from a signage and graphics background. When they designed this machine, they had the idea that it was going to transform the signage market. Um, and the reality is that what we're finding is that there's much more adoption in prototyping, in uh, you know gaming, in medical, those those types of markets. And part of those reasons are that um, these materials uh, 
do fine outside until the the uh, you get to the weather extreme so if you get really really hot which um, this summer seems to be everywhere in the united states or you get very very cold um, you know when it's cold things can get a little brittle when it's hot if you have thinner pieces they can start to uh, soften and get a bit deformed with the sun so signage is something that that uh, i think you can definitely do with this machine outdoor signage is probably something that uh um, I would say you want to do some testing ahead of time and see how that's going to work for, for the environment that you have. That we can move on to the next slide. Oh, awesome. Uh, okay. So speaking of, of prototyping and things like that, so so who is the the who is this uh, technology for? It's for people where, who uh, the the color gamut and the color accuracy is number one on their list, right? There are 3D printers out there that have stronger materials, um, but there is no other 3D color or 3D printer out there that has the, the amount of color accuracy and the amount of uh, color gamut that the Momaki has, right? We're able to do fine detail. And, and unfortunately, this, this slide doesn't uh, show it as cleanly as, as you would see in person, um, but that shoe, which is doo -doo 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 -doo, right here, um, the amount of detail on this shoe from the, the texture that you can see on the bottom to there's, uh, and I'm not sure how well this is going to show, but the, the texture in the, uh, um, the fabric area, things like that, that detail getting down to 22 microns and, and below um, really does an amazing job, right? So, so markets for this machine, obviously um, entertainment and gaming, which we've seen, collectible figures, which we've seen. Uh, medical models, we do have uh, some major uh, medical facilities in the United States that are using uh, this technology right now. Visual prototyping, footwear, packaging, consumer goods, toys, um, and then there's some uh, GIS mapping stuff that you're going to see in a little bit as well. So yeah, prototyping and, and uh, limited production uh, collectible type things, that, that I think is really kind of the sweet spot. Um, we've been uh, really pleasantly surprised at how uh, the gaming industries have, have really um, um, kind of flocked to this machine and this technology. So I, I, think, uh, I think Shapeways is going to see some really cool models uh, coming through, and I'm excited to see what, what kind of things um, they can output with it. Now, could this be used for jewelry? Uh, yeah, yeah, it absolutely could. Um, I would I would say that when you're talking about jewelry, if you're thinking about uh, like let's say a pendant or a brooch, absolutely. Um, if you're talking about making a chain with it, um, you can definitely do it. But that's where again that tensile strength of the material might not be the the best choice. Um, but yeah, for doing jewelry, earrings, that sort of thing, absolutely. the new 2207 oh. and are we going to be talking about that so uh i will i will uh for for this presentation the the 553 is really the main uh thing because that is what shapeways is currently using i will address the 2207 real quickly and then we'll slide through the main things to know about the 2207 is same photopolymer resins right so the color that you get from the 553 you can get from the 2207 uh, much smaller build area, and it will be slower. Um, if you have questions about the 2207, you're welcome to, to uh, email me directly or contact me directly. And I will say that you will be seeing the 2207 printing live in the booth at the Rapid TCT show in mid-September uh, in Chicago. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. So uh, print head technology, I, I won't spend a, a huge amount of time on this, um, but just the fact that the print heads that we use are uh, industrial inkjet heads, they're piezoelectric heads, um, and they're variable drop grayscale heads. And what that means is that we're able to jet droplets at multiple velocities in order to have them join in the air, which is like crazy science fiction stuff, in order to create larger drops to be able to get the different drop size that we want. Why is that important? Um, because in order to get uh, full, you know, deep color coverage, like these, these reds and black, and also be able to get do, 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 uh, really, really uh, fine, fine detail, 
on a model. You've got to be able to have the big, big drops to get the, the deep, rich color and the little bitty drops in order to get the detail, right? So uh, how we do that is, is, again, a little bit of science fiction through this waveform control. Um, and and I'll, I'll just kind of breeze through this, but the, the basic idea here is that we're able to send an electrical signal very, very accurately that tells the piezoelectric crystal how to pulse and when to pulse in order to be able to jet out the droplet at the volume that we want, the shape that we want, and make sure that it lands in the place that we want in order to get um, the most accurate color. So it's, it's one thing to be able to jet a whole bunch of ink, but it's another thing to have it land where you want, in the shape that you want, in the place that you want. Right? So interesting. These guys are using electrified crystal to shoot color onto a surface. That's what I'm saying. It's mind blowing. It's crazy stuff. All right. And then we talked about this a little bit earlier. So we use uh, UV lamps because we're able to control uh, each individual lamp to get the, the bulb to, to turn on where we want, when we want. Um, so when we jet the ink down, we on the, the image on the left hand side, you see that the, the UV LED on the right is curing it just to get the ink held in place. And then when the carriage returns to the right hand side, you can see the roller is coming down. It's uniform or making a uniform layer. And then the UV LED lamp is uh, curing it there as well, right? To get it to that solid. And then we repeat that, that process. Okay. Okay, we have another poll question. This is our last poll question for the day. What height do you feel you can print a 3D piece in full color? So I'm going to say this is a bit of a trick question because it doesn't say what is the maximum height. I did. So yes, I, that, I may have I done that on purpose. Correct. <laughs> but yeah, in this, in this particular machine, um, we can do uh, 20 by 20 by 12 inches. So uh, we can go up to 12 inches tall, which is, is uh, crazy big. But we can also go down, as someone mentioned there. Thank you for that. Also small. We can go under two inches, as, as noted by right these little guys. So, so really any size you need. Um, and so let's take a look at some stuff that is uh, big. So these are, these are probably, uh, as far as uh, Mamaki USA, these are probably the two, or not probably, these are the two largest pieces that, that we have printed. So one on the left-hand side is, is actually a uh, GIS map of a island, uh, the island of Boro Boro, which is in the Fijian Islands, I believe. Um, the story behind this one is that they're trying to figure out how to build a dam in order to make a freshwater reservoir in order to uh, have fresh water for this particular island. So this one is uh, was uh, almost the full bed size in the X and Y axis, and then it's six inches tall. Um, we printed this in what we call standard print mode, which is 32 microns, and it took us 93 hours. Um, so uh, I think that really speaks to, to the, the quality of the Momaki uh, machines. That's 93 hours um, unmanned, un, you know, started on Friday, come back uh, after the weekend, and, and that's totally done. Um, and that, that, if you flip it over, it's mostly solid. There's a bit of a honeycomb uh, that Jaime did on the bottom of it in order to save some weight, but that, that's a really, really cool piece. So the other one, which is, is, has to be my favorite thing that, that we've ever printed was the nemesis uh, model by an artist called dope Pope, um, who he does uh, these like contract Godzilla models and things like that. He's an amazing guy. Um, so that piece is 18 inches tall. Uh, it was printed in two pieces um, where the tail section where it attached to the body actually comes off and what uh, what we did, and this speaks to one of the one of the comments earlier about being able to print color and clear and things like that. Um, Jaime hollowed out that entire model um, in uh, ZBrush, I think it was, or Blender, I don't remember. Um, and then the 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 yellow uh, ovals that you see on, on Nemesis on its neck are actually tinted clear, uh, so it's clear with a bit of uh, yellow and magenta. 
Um, and then we put LEDs in a battery pack inside of the model and then attached the tail so that it would actually glow uh, from the inside. Um, but that was 158 hours of printing uh, because that one uh, literally, I think we printed him kind of face down and then the tail separate. So he took up a lot of the, the Z axis height. Um, but again, it, it, it printed for a week and, and uh, turned out perfect. And, and we, uh, we took that to one of the ZBrush shows and it was a huge, huge hit. So some, some really great examples of things that you'll be able to do uh, with the machine with, at Shapeways. Um, basically, you know, if it, if it fits in the build chamber, you, you can print it. All right. Uh, so another thing, which this is a little bit on the technical side, but uh, the Momaki machine is is one of the few out there that has a, a, a true ICC color workflow. I shouldn't say it's, it's, it's the only one that has a true ICC color workflow, but it has a customizable ICC workflow. So Shapeways, let's say, um, you know, with multiple machines, oftentimes a customer will create uh, custom ICC profiles. Um, that uh, is a file that describes the output condition of the machine under a, a uh, particular environment in order to ensure that if you have uh, multiples of these machines that each one prints uh, uh, the same. So you get you get consistent color across them, right? Uh, another amazing model uh, by uh, Martin Verhoeven. Um, this was uh, one that we did a, a while back and, and unfortunately it, it took us a while to get this to him because of the pandemic, we had some, some craziness, but um, that's finally in his hands and that's just an amazing uh, gremlin model. That one is about uh, I think that one's probably about uh, eight inches tall, but that was printed on uh, on its back. And again, the, he comes off of the base and then lays down. So it was printed in two pieces. Uh, so for the designers in the group, um, we can work with uh, vertex color. So meaning that if you have an a object that's, that's built of multiple uh, polygons, you can assign a color to each individual polygon. Um, we can also work with UV mapping, which is uh, uh, what you see on the right-hand side. You have a, a 2D image projected or wrapped onto a 3D model um, as a texture. Um, that seems to be kind of the, the best uh, workflow because it allows you to have a high resolution um, texture with a lower polygon count. Whereas if you use vertex color and you do low polygon count, um, you're gonna affect how the, how the color looks, right? Uh, so we support uh, STL, OBJ, PLY, WRL, and 3MS files. Uh, I'm not sure, I guess I should have asked this earlier, on the Shapeway side, if they're going to be accepting all of those formats. I would assume STL and OBJ for sure, maybe 3MF. PLY and, and uh, WRL are not used all that often um, in our workflow. And then you'll see in a minute that there are some options if you use STL where you can assign color uh, within the software. Um, if you're using the, the wrap texture, uh, OBJ or 3MF are the best choices where OBJ seems to be kind of our personal favorite in-house. Any questions? Move on. We're good so far. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So if you have original STL data, so in this case, what we, me being the amazing 3D designer that I am, I made a cube and I colored it red. That's about the extent of my design abilities. Uh, so if that's the original STL data uh, within the software, you can assign a color, uh, any color you want to it. You can have it just be white, which is the, the kind of raw core material. You can uh, make it be clear, which is just the clear ink, or you can do what's called skeleton color, meaning that you can have clear, but you can assign whatever tint on top of it that you want. Right. Again, uh, we've got an artist that does uh, these, these surfing wave things, and so he'll have the water and it will be a clear print, but there's assigned a, a uh, you know, a, an aqua color in order for the water to, to look like water. Um, and then with SDLs, um, you can nest objects inside of other objects and assign color to them uh, separately and then end up with a, a, an assembly that is, um, say, a, uh, um, uh, an opaque object inside of a transparent object. Those things can all be done. So let's talk a little bit about full color. This is, this is one of those things that, that uh, this is a little um, kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, in the marketplace, we, we hear the term full color 3D printing thrown around, around a lot. We hear full color, we hear full spectrum, we hear photorealistic. Um, and there's different technologies um, 
in in full color or in color 3D printing that that have these these different uh, uh, gamuts or limitations, right? Um, so what I think is important is when when you look at the image on the left hand side. So that's a representation of a, of a fairly full gamut at 16 million colors, and you can see that <coughs> the gradation between colors is is very clean. It's very smooth. There's not a lot of separation between colors. Um, and that when you look at that smooth color gradation, you can see that it's nice and even and, and smooth, right? When you take that same image and you drop it from being uh, built with 16 million colors down to a thousand colors, you can really see that the steps between colors becomes very, very uh, noticeable. Uh, and within the gradient, it becomes posterized and you've got you know delineation between each individual individual step. Um, so we have, um, this is kind of our point of pride with the, with the 3D UJ553 is the fact that we can do 10 million colors. Um, again, there are, there are other uh, materials, there are other machines out there that also do a lot of colors, but not nearly as, as many as the Mamaki can do. So Josh, if you're like trying to match a Pantone, obviously you're not gonna nail it with Mamaki, but compared to all the other competitors in the market, you're gonna get the closest. Yeah, yeah, that that's absolutely true. I wouldn't say that that we're not going to nail it. There are definitely one, you know, Pantone colors that are well within the, the gamut of the machine, um, but there are certainly Pantone colors that are outside of, of any traditional CMYK printing device. Which which whether you're talking about Mamaki or 3D Systems or Stratasys or HP, they're they're all CMYK output devices, right? The the, the best way that I can think of it is is Pantone is something like a uh, thousand seventy six specific colors that are all defined, right? And if you're in the in the printing world and you want a specific Pantone color, whether it's Pantone one eighty six or whatever it might be, you're literally going to have a a can of ink that is that color, right? So the the analogy that that I really uh, I I really like is is the idea that if Pantone has a thousand colors, it's like having a thousand crayons, right? Like you got the box, you know, you went to the store and when it was time to buy school supplies and you wanted the, the big box of crayons, had the sharpener on the front and all that, right? So you, you're trying to match one of these 1,070 crayons, right? Well, the printer, if you think of that as a box of crayons as well, um, where some of the other machines, they've only got 500 crayons or a million crayons. We have 10 million crayons, right? So our ability to, or, or the, the, uh, the, the, percentage chance that you're going to be able to match one of those thousand colors is much better if you're working with a box of 10 million crayons than if you're working with a box of 500 crayons, right? So yeah, I think we, we definitely have uh, uh, the edge when it comes to being able to most closely hit color, where you, whether you're talking about a Pantone color or you're talking about a uh, logo specific signature color for a company, uh, the Mamaki is going to have your best opportunity to do that. We have a question about gradient, but I think that is in your next couple of slides. So okay. I'll let you talk about it and see if it answers the question. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so we'll get to the gradient thing in just a minute, but uh, this is one other uh, thing I wanted to mention. So um, uh, there's the number of colors that a, a printer can output, but then there's also how many colors does the color system allow you to request? And one of the things that Momaki does that uh, the other uh, 3D color uh, printer manufacturers can don't do is that we also support the Adobe RGB 1998 color space as well as sRGB. So you can see from the graphic there, Adobe RGB 1998, which was really developed uh, for CMYK printers or to better encompass the, the gamuts of CMYK printers, um, is, is more extended than the sRGB gamut, specifically in the greens and blues uh, and cyan areas, right? So, so you're able to request more color. And if you can, if you pair up the ability to ask for more color with an output device that can deliver more color, then you end up with more accurate, better color, period. All right, so let's see an example of that. So this is uh, uh, two images here, one on the left, one on the right. And this is the Mamaki 3D UJ553 versus the HP Jet Fusion 580. And the Jet Fusion 580, which is a very popular uh, 3D printer, uh, I don't know if Shapeways has one of those. I think maybe they do, not sure. Nope, don't have one, Never mind. Um, but it's a, it's a powder-based printer. Um, so it's, it's fusing a, a 
uh, powder in order to, to create a solid, and they do have the, the Jet Fusion 580 is their full color version of it. Now, on the, on the plus side for the uh, Jet Fusion 580 is that their material is stronger. So, so you've got a lot more tensile, tensile strength uh, on the Jet Fusion 580 than you have with the Momaki. But uh, on the Momaki side, if you take a look uh, at the image on the left, you can see the Jet Fusion 580 print is on the bottom and the Momaki 3D UJ 553 print is on the top. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is that the uh, texture difference between the two, right? The, the powder-based print is, is a much rougher feel coming right off of the printer, um, whereas the Momaki print, it's a, it's a plastic print um, because of the, the photopolymer, so it's a much smoother print. But what's more striking than that is when you look at the color difference um, going from red to orange to yellow to green, um, on the HP print, you can see it, it's very... Uh, it's a very abrupt change, especially from the orange to yellow and from the yellow to the, the lime green, let's say. It, it, it steps very harshly. Um, whereas if you look at the Mamaki print on top, it's a much cleaner, smoother gradient, right? So that, that's really where you're going to see a lot of the difference. Um, even more striking than that is if you look at the image on the right-hand side, um, you can see that the Mamaki print, we go from a green to a cyan to a, to a deep violet, really, color. Again, a nice, smooth transition. <clears throat> but we're able to go through all those colors. When you look at the same print from the HP machine on the left-hand side, um, not only is the gradient more abrupt, but the gradient actually stops because they're, they can't get anywhere close to that, that deep, rich indigo color. It just isn't within their, their color gamut at all. So I think these are two really good real-world examples of um, where the color gamut on the Momaki machine is, is um, so valuable. And again, as we talked about earlier, um, the Momaki uh, machine or the, is really designed for people where color is the primary concern. In this case, if you needed that particular little uh, fixture to, to then withstand a bunch of force, but color wasn't that critical, maybe the Momaki machine isn't the one for you. But if you say, look, this, this color is representing where stress points are within this particular model, on the right-hand side, if that indigo is showing a particular level of stress, um, you can see that in the Mamaki machine or the Mamaki model, but you cannot see it at all in the HP model. Does that answer the gradient question? It answered part of it. No but, uh, the other part is, can you do a smooth transition from opaque to transparent? Can you do a smooth transition from opaque to transparent? Ke, 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 ke. Um, sort of. Okay, so um, there, there's two parts to this answer. One is we could make it look like that, but there's going to be an area where you're going from opaque, opaque to transparent, which is going to be a pretty clean break, but you could have a color transition on top of that. The second part of it is that the way to do what I believe you're asking to do is to do it through voxel-based color. Um, the Mamaki machine absolutely supports voxel-based color. The question is, does the workflow feeding the machine support voxel-based color, right? So straight out of the box, the Mamaki software uh, does not do that. I'm not sure about the Shapeway side of it, um, but there's some other things. Um, there's some limitations in using voxel-based color or voxel-based printing, period. Um, which is um, more file format based. It's, it's pretty awkward to do, but there's some things happening uh, with file formats um, uh, and specific, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about that, but around some of the, some of the file formats that uh, in the coming months we're gonna see has better support for uh, voxel, better support for transparency and better support for color. So can the machine do it? Absolutely. Can the software feeding the machine do it? It's a little tricky right now, but we're going to see uh, in the in the uh, hopefully pretty near future that that's going to become a whole lot easier. Do the colors fade over time? Uh, so um, I would say it depends. In general, I would say not not really. I have uh, I've got samples in my office here that have been around for um, many years in an office environment that show no sign of fading whatsoever. Um, 
if though you took one of these models and you put it into a south facing window and you left it there over time with direct sunlight yeah you you would see some fading right because again we're working with photopolymers and they are going to be affected by it but i would say uh, i'm confident in saying that these models are, are very steadfast um, in their color uh, in, a, in a typical environment great thank you yep all right so we have just a couple more slides uh, I think I'm going to let Steve talk about this one. Orange has been a customer of Shapeways for many, many years um, and really started just from an idea of two guys who got, came together and wanted to, you know, bring some of the, the, the gaming ideas they had from fully customizing their characters to life. Um, and, and traditionally in the tabletop space, it's, you print out your character and you paint it. Well, what if you don't want to paint it? Or what if you're not good at painting? Print exactly like me. Um, then all of a sudden you want to make that investment. You want to, and in all reality, the technology wasn't here. Like we had tried other full color options. We had really, really done it. And until Mamaki came along, we really weren't able to get to the fine level of detail, you know, on the micron level and kind of what Josh has been talking about from the color perspective, you know, I mean, if you just look at some of these characters here, you can see, um, you know, even the, the slight shading uh, really helps uh, define the face and the smaller features and characteristics of these uh, characters. So, um, yeah, I, I would think without Mamaki, we would never have been able to truly release a full color option for Hero Forge that would meet the requirements of the player and then bring their gaming experience to life and really make them feel kind of endeared to their character that they're able to customize on the Hero Forge side. So, um, yeah, it, it's been pretty amazing to see where the technology has come just even over the past couple of years and, and where we've gotten it to. So. Can I also add that um, if you've never tried the Hero Forge uh, customizer, it is basically a video game in of itself. You can waste an amazing amount of time customizing your character because the, the number of options in there are insane. And they keep adding more and more options to it, which is which is really, really cool. So yeah, yeah. definitely check that out. It's 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 an amazing, amazing thing. Yeah, weekly on Tuesdays are always new features. And one cool thing, too, is you go in, you create a profile, they'll actually save your uh, feature set. So you can go back and play with it later if you run out of time. Very cool. In the handouts section, we have three handouts that everyone can download. It is the case study for Hero Forge, a case study for Mamaki, and a one sheet about Mamaki capabilities. Awesome. Thank you. All right, just a couple more slides. Uh, so this is this is another one that's that's near and dear to my heart. So um, we were contacted uh, by a gentleman named uh, Olaf Digel out of the University of Auckland uh, in New Zealand, um, and he has a side business designing uh, or, or making ad through, uh, making guitars through additive manufacturing, uh, and his company is called Odd Guitars. Um, and so he contacted us and said, hey, I've got this idea for a full color uh, 3D printed guitar. Would you guys be interested? And we said, absolutely. Uh, so this guitar that you see, uh, the body is, is fully 3D printed in the Mamaki 3D UJ553. The neck is a traditional neck. There is a block of wood that's in the back of the guitar that the neck is attached to. Um, but this is a fully functional uh, uh, guitar. It sounds amazing. Uh, the image on the left-hand side is actually uh, a Mamaki regional manager for Toronto. His name is Lucas Crossley, and he has a, uh, a YouTube channel, U Lucas Crossley Gu Guitar. So if you go on YouTube, you can see and hear uh, this guitar being played, and there is an interview there between uh, Lucas, me, and uh, Olaf Dijel, the designer of the guitar, and you can learn all about uh, what he does and, and how he did it. And we're really uh, proud to say that after this, he was so excited about it that the University of Auckland bought a Mamaki 3D UJ553. So that was a really cool uh, um, uh, example of, of what can be done. So that, that body of the guitar, the entire thing was printed all in one piece. Again, just came off the bed, dissolved away the uh, support material, and then we shipped it to New Zealand and uh, uh, Olaf put the guitar together. Really cool stuff. And I think for me, that is all I have. 
So certainly open to any uh, questions, uh, either from the Shapeways folks or from anybody uh, uh, that is attending. We do have a question about flexible inks and materials, and is that going to be in the future of Mimaki? That is a question that we get a lot, and um, I would say it is in the future. I can't tell you the timeline for that. That is uh, probably one of the most requested uh, things from Mimaki and, and certainly something that we know that our competitors have. Um, we've been really, really focused on the color part of it, and as I, I hinted to earlier, the, the clear part of our materials, but uh, flexible is, is something that we are uh, aware of, and um, I can't really say more than that at the moment. Okay, with that, we do have um, other questions that uh, I think are going to take us longer than four minutes to answer. So we will follow up with each uh, person who we didn't get to your questions to answer. Uh, and I will turn it over to Steve to wrap up our presentation today. I mean, the, the question, interaction, everything else was really, really fun to see, fun to see the excitement. I, I personally love this technology, and I think we're, we're almost on the precipice to see, and I think almost we're waiting for the design to catch up with the actual abilities of the machine. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to kind of see where this will take us. Um, thanks again, Josh, for coming in here, talking about it. Um, and then anybody who in the audience does want to have an additional questions, wants to follow up, please reach out to the Shapeways team um, over the website or your dedicated account manager, and we will absolutely help you out from a design perspective, printing perspective. You know, we're here to do anything in regards to full color um, 3D printing. And thank you so much. Steve, you bring up a great um, point about design for 3D color. and. Mamaki and Shapeways is going to be doing another webinar in October. We are finalizing the dates for a design webinar specifically for full, full color. We will definitely email everyone who registered for this webinar to attend that one once that date is solidified. That's exactly what I was going to mention. Yeah, I, uh, we're really, really excited about that. As I mentioned, uh, uh, our, our uh, application specialist or 3D application specialist, Jaime Martinez, um, who you may have seen around the web, he, he has some really great tips and tricks on um, designing for uh, full color 3D, uh, whether you're a ZBrush person or you're a Blender person or you're a Adobe Substance person. Um, he's, he's got a lot of great knowledge and we're super excited to, to get with the Shapeways team and, and share that. So yeah, we look forward to seeing everybody in October. That's all I've got. <laughs> Thanks so much, Josh and Steve, for your great insight. And we hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.